Chapter 1. Fed World. Blunt was driving a Ford Civic twin-turbo diesel black standard issue fed car. He was driving through the Arizona desert just under the speed limit of 127 miles per hour. The radio was blaring and then it stopped suddenly. Fed cigarette had just run out. He lit up a new Federale Smith and Western Big Smoke and the radio blared back on. Blunt preferred the Smith and Western radio even though the cigarettes only lasted between 20 and 25 minutes. He found the ads less abrasive, taking puffs only five minutes apart. Compared to more commercial channels like Hubble Bubble that forced f listeners to pop gum between every song. The car was bakingly hot with a black plastic dash seeming to ooze a mixture of the composite chemicals it was made out of into the hot cramped cockpit of the car. Blunt had one hand lazily on the steering wheel, one hand crooked against the left hand car wall, elbow placed on the window sill on the shut window. The Smith and Western cigarette was keeping the radio playing for now. The song playing seemed to have been ripped directly from a Betamax cowboy videotape. It was unclear the origin of the tape or the film it contained. Occasionally there were Spanish voices. Blunt had gotten a message in his pigeonhole from dispatch. Samuel Matterhorn had given him the task of going down to the Paradise Hotel and investigating Greys. Blunt was never enthusiastic. He was feeling particularly listless and directionless as he drove on a perfectly straight road towards the Paradise Motel. He was wearing thin standard issue fed pants. These were long black trousers which blended effortlessly into a pair of white crisp socks slotted into a polyester faux leather sneaker set. The socks were held up against the bottom of where his legs became fatty with a syrup-like glue which hardened and held the socks in place for days at a time. The cream also contained ibuprofen. His faux leather sneakers had small electric fan blades in the back of them, which if working would move cool air over his feet. The bottom of his shoes had small metal imprints, which would leave in the dust his name and phone number in case of emergency. Blunt only had five more cigarettes and was quickly running out of this one. He knew he would arrive within a few hours and began rationing the cigarettes. Blunt's shirt was standard issue too. Everything about him was standard issue. The polyester, cotton and acrylic blend shirt stuck painfully on his sweaty chest. There were only three buttons on the shirt. The others weren't missing, but replaced with Velcro. At the top of his shirt was a small CCD camera sensor and lens in the topmost button. A wire from this ran through his shirt, through his sleeve, and dangled at the other end. There's a small standard issue dictaphone that would be plugged into this port allowing to record video and sound for documentary purposes, 
proof of purchase and proof of meal and cigarette consumption while on duty. Blunt's eyes strayed from the shimmering horizon line. His gleaming black and chrome sunglasses glistened with a voluptuous luster. His eyes dashed across kilometers of horizon, sweeping huge amounts of desert. The desert looked just like any desert. There was a large amount of inflatable cactuses, slowly purring, and there was a small billboard which gradually became larger as Blunt drove towards it. It was advertising the concept of a child Macaulay Culkin. The picture was of the child, holding a large chrome ball which reflected not only the child's face but the camera too. The legend on the picture read, Macaulay Culkin. Blunt ran out of cigarettes. The radio snapped to commercial two. The advert playing was for Pizza Express. A woman was sobbing in the advertisement. She was recounting a time where she had been raped. The two police officers were giggling and sniggering and eating slices of hot pie. Blunt felt empty. He assumed that feeling was hunger. Blunt could now see the first signs of the motel approaching. There was a large gathering of artificial clouds moving in soft, pattering semicircles. The Dapple Roadway soon delivered the Paradise Motel to Blunt. Blunt reached his hand down into the gear chamber. The warm, fleshy, throttling vibrations calmed him as he fingered the gear holes. The car purringly changed down, allowing him to slow down for the exit. The clouds, noticing the new customer, quickly shuffled to shade him from the blistering sun. Blunt always liked to remark that the clouds are made of similar stuff to his shoes and operated with the same electric fan method, but instead of cooling, were used to locate themselves in the sky. Blunt preened down the curving road towards the motel. He could see it now. It was quite unexceptional. A large, concrete, curving, verbose structure with four stories separated by balcony corridors. Each room had a door and a large window, shutters, tin foil and survival blankets muffled the windows and hid the interiors, but he could make out some faces, people, lighting decorations and ornamentation inside of the dark rooms. In the forecourt, there was a pool that had been concreted over. There was a spattering of armchairs. Blunt thought, no, not armchairs. Barker lounges or deck chairs. He knew that he would be asked about this building later when he was reporting in. The lack of cigarette smoke in the car was causing the windows to turn opaque, and he could barely see through them now. Blunt desperately tried to remember what the chairs looked like. Thin, white plastic stretched over a tubular metal frame. He would have time to study the building better, he thought, when the car stopped, which it did. Parking under the synth clouds, the large parking lot only had a few cars and vehicles. Most of them had the guttural signifiers of hippies, stargazers, layabouts, drug addicts, pornographers, and radiator repairmen. The car 
purred to a stop. Blunt opened the door and stood up, languorously stretching his arms, bending and squeezing his calves one at a time, and then moving backwards and forwards on the front and ball of his foot. Blunt connected the dictaphone cable and camera up, holding it in his left hand. Blunt was holding a small 23 Magnum in a leather pouch case under his right armpit. The gun was very small, measuring about 5 centimetres long and 2 centimetres wide, and it hung parasitically under his armpit, engorging in juices brought around by the heat of the desert, which hit him in its entirety as he finished stretching. Slamming the door, Blunt walked towards the reception area. He didn't know if he was expected, if someone had rung ahead, or if they had seen his coming, or if the clouds had a link to the office. He entered. A small bell connected to the wall, which was hit by the door opening, rang. The bell rang out shrill and didn't stop for a series of minutes. Blunt approached the desk with the bell still chiming in the background. The foyer was almost empty. There was a small plastic fern which was nestling in the corner of the octagonal shaped room. There were seven doors leading in and out, including the one Blunt had entered. The desk, which split the room in two, had no one on the other side. Imitation wood panelling was peeling off, revealing newspaper and cornflake boxes, pinning up the scatological roof pinnings above. Though Blunt couldn't see it, he could hear an air conditioning unit humming, pumping refrigerated air into the frigid, bone-dry room. Blunt hit the bell on the counter twice. It was the classical dome with a button on top, like you would see in a TV show. The bell was stereotypical in its sounding. The bell was electrically connected to a set of speakers hanging above the front desk. And with a delay that seemed perceivable, the microphone picked up the bell noises and repeated them. The receptionist shuffled out. She was wearing a large flower shuffled shirt made of some synthetic silk. The shirt was slightly plastered to her not too small Brawlest breasts. She was maybe in her late twenties. Blunt found it difficult to tell. She approached the desk. She was wearing the type of slippers housewives would wear if they were awoken by a noise in the night and went to investigate it. She sat down in the green revolving office chair next to the bell. She could access an ugly, small, light computer there. She looked up, a blunt. Are you trying to book a room here? She asked. Yeah, I'm looking for an overnight stay, Blunt replied. I think we can help you out with that. We are a motel after all, she replied. Oh, that's good, Blunt replied. She asked Blunt what type of room he wanted what he was like, where he was when he realised he was mortal for the first time, when he lost his first teeth, what colours he liked, what aspects of a woman were the most arousing to him, the last time he had cried, and what type of socks he liked wearing. The receptionist eventually decided that he wanted a north-facing room, 
A north-facing room would allow negative chakra energy to leave his body while he was sleeping, creating a more positive working and living environment for himself, which he obviously needed. Blunt thanked her, and she reached backwards while sitting down for the room key, pushing herself with her slippered feet towards the keys which were kept on a large grid pinned up by small golden hooks. Blunt was happy with any room. The room's location and direction was superfluous to his mission and he could sleep almost anywhere. With the almost lethal amount of sleeping pills that he was taking. Anything else? The receptionist asked. Handing over the small bundle of keys with a large plastic fob with the number 2003 emblazoned in yellow on the otherwise transparent fob. Yeah. Blunt replied, I'm looking for somewhere to eat. She told Blunt that there was a restaurant a few miles down the road. Blunt smiled and turned to leave, and then did leave. The bell rang again. It hadn't finished ringing from his entry, and the double chimes merged together, forming a harmonium that he could hear ringing in his head as he walked to his car. He didn't go into his room, and instead drove directly to the restaurant. The restaurant was a McDonald's. It had large ceramic golden arches hanging suspended above it. The cables shot up into the sky until they disappeared. Blunt wanted drive through, but first he picked up a prostitute by the side of the road. Her name was C. She was younger than Blunt, but was wearing the same amount of standard issue prostitute wear as Blunt. This is how Blunt picked her up. Blunt saw her and began to decrease speed with his fingers in the gear holes. Sliding up to the side of the road, his car crunched over the small gravel particles and detritus that had found itself onto the road surface. His tyres bulged and compressed. He slowed down to a stop, almost parallel to her. His electric windscreen slid over him. She sorted over to the right-hand side of his car. Sky asked, am I in trouble, officer? in a lurking, mocking way. Blunt shook his head, and she told him about her ranks, told him that she was a prostitute and would accept money for sex. Blunt told her to open the door and asked her if she wanted food. She replied in the affirmative, and they continued driving to McDonald's. There was a new drive through there, and the process took them about 20 minutes to get through. There was a small musical performance, and then a matinee afterwards. Eventually they finished driving through the safari section of the drive through Their burgers arrived wrapped in banana leaves in small cardboard crashes.
Blake used his federal parole discount card to get money off of his shake. They sat in the car with advert radio blaring. As they began eating, the camera in the steering wheel registered the food change and the radio station changed from Advertronic to the McDonald's Food Frequency Band. The program today was of a woman being eaten out by a golden retriever. There was moaning emanating from the radio. The two ate their food in almost silence in the car, listening to the salacious radio gurgling. Blunt kept rubbing the grease from his burger off his hands onto his trousers, making his trousers seem tinned with a greasy, thick, Kevlar, Kevlar-like substance coating his thighs. Sky seemed to have enjoyed a free meal. And the mycerial enzymes in the food were chuckling away in her stomach as the starch in the burger bread turned her, the corners of her mouth up in this smile that could only come with a hearty McDonald's meal. As Blunt finished his shake, he began backing out of the parking lot. The radio changed back to scrambled, gurgling, troglodytic ads. Before they returned to the room, they stopped off at a 7-Eleven. A 7-Eleven was a rectangle by the side of the road with a roof that looked like an Egyptian pyramid with the top sliced off. Inside you could buy meat, food, plastic and cellophane. Blunt bought small meat tubes. He explained to Skye that he was hunting an alien that had infiltrated their planet through a dimensional porthole or teleported. He wasn't quite too sure yet. And his thinking was it might be hungry and probably would like to eat a tube of meat as it seemed an alien form of food and highly advanced because of its compression and the amount of protein the package boasted of containing was surely enough to merit being considered futuristic and space aged. Sky said that they should buy some astronaut ice cream. There wasn't any in the store and Blunt expressed quiet derision. As aliens are from space, they wouldn't consider travelling in space being astronautic, and it would be quite demeaning giving them astronaut ice cream, as it would be like giving an adult baby food. Sky wasn't too pleased about being corrective, corrected, especially in such a subjective manner over what she thought was helping a federal officer. She went outside and stood by the car, waiting for Blunt to pay. He did, and returned to the car. Opening the door and entering, he had bought a new pack of cigarettes, sharing them with the prostitute Sky. The radio changed to a more cheery, bluesy station. The song appeared to be about buying a new oven. It was gas operated, but the distortion from the radio made it hard to tell the direct, what the direct messaging of the song truly was. 
On the drive back, Sky asked him if he was carrying a gun. Blunt responded by pulling it out. She was horrified. Not only by a man brandishing a killing device on her on such short notice, but by its puny, chode-like size, implying sexual inadequacy on part of Blunt. He explained to Skye that the gun was so small because it was designed for a child to shoot. Federal officers were not allowed to shoot anyone, and instead they were told to issue the gun to the child and allow the child to make a non-biased decision on who to shoot in any encounter. He thought this was common knowledge, but Skye explained that she hadn't been taught standard curriculum, as from an early age it was decided that she was to become a motel prostitute because of her aptitude scores during a McDonald's birthday party when she was six. Her colouring was very inadequate, using red on the faces, eyes and hair, and not cross-hatching the sky in any discernible way, missing lines and spilling some of her carrot-flavoured drink over the bottom of the sheet before handing it in. She told Blunt about a time she was attacked by a man who refused to pay for having sexual intercourse with her. Blunt didn't respond. They pulled up to the same parking spot as before and got out and walked towards their hotel room. Blunt told her that after they had sexual intercourse, he would pay her to stay on, allowing her to use his small gun intended for children, as her hands were much smaller than his, and her low IQ and test scores implied that she had a childlike demeanour and innocence to her that would allow her to shoot people without any bias either racial or sexual she agreed and expressed interest in, she agreed and expressed interest in shooting someone as she had never done something like that before the hotel room was dark with only the harsh light from outside cutting through the morose interior the room smelled very slightly of some sort of fungal damp which was impossible due to the almost zero humidity of the desert. On one of the walls was a large mural of Lady Diana, the late princess of England. She was handing out compasses to blind children. This was a common depiction of her nowadays. The bed was made and on the pillow was a small edible duck whistle made out of a slightly translucent edible material that was also used in edible kitchenware for military purposes. Blunt didn't know if this was common practice or someone had mistakenly left the whistle there, but Skye excitedly bounded over and began soaking the whistle in her spit, allowing it to soften up to the point where she could chew it. The motel room in the Paradise Hotel was quite nice. Blunt could easily imagine himself in a few minutes, naked and sweaty, and asking the prostitute to shoot him in the back of the head. He had forgotten to bring any water or water filters and would have to chance drinking from the tap or the vending machine outside. The taps were as follows. LaCroix, hot LaCroix, LaCroix cool, LaCroix white, Coca-Cola pure, Coca-Cola water plus, Fanta nitrous bubbles, Dream LaCroix, Arctic blast, 
Fanta Magnum Plus, Potent Override Dream Thinker, and Cause Light Sport Ultimate. Drooping cab- cannabinoid spiders hung in the room. Sky, the prostitute, was preparing herself for the sexual encounter that she assumed was coming. Blunt moved to the bathroom and poured himself a LaCroix Plus Ultimate. It filled the small dinosaur-shaped glass, and he began removing his trousers and shirt. It was around 1pm, and the daily fireworks went up around the time he was finishing, around 1.10pm. Sky didn't really seem to mind. Blunt was satisfied and didn't feel like asking her to shoot him in the back of the head with a small pistol designed for a child to operate. Instead, he asked her to tell her, him about her childhood, her home, her parents, about her father, about holiday homes and chalets and dogs and pets and one-off encounters with people that left large marks on her, about hiding in wooden dresses and behind curtains, about scars that he had investigated with his fingers while they were having sex. She did, and talked to him about all those things, some true, some fictitious, some half-remembered. Blunt had not finished inside of her and instead had sprayed his load onto the bedsheets that were already stained and maligned through years, decades or perhaps even an eternity of fucking prostitutes. Or careful, carefree masturbation. Around 3pm they showered one at a time. Blunt was getting a headache and washed his penis with LaCroix from one of the tap sinks. The lightly carbonated, sugary drink left him feeling sticky, but it achieved its desired result. They clothed themselves and Blake and Blunt explained to her that he was going to try and find the Grey that was living in one of these rooms and ask him what he was doing on this plane of existence or planet or whatever he was from and see if he was willing to go back peacefully or just the general situation, you know, we're not really too sure what he's doing here or even if he's here, he might just be some guy from Indiana who fell in some Grey paint or something. As they left the room, They saw the receptionist who was smoking a long green cigarette. She smiled and waved, obviously acknowledging that this federal officer had just been in coitus with a prostitute inside one of their rooms. We're just going to go door to door and ask them if they have an alien, said Blunt. What if they lie? asked Skye. Blunt explained that if they were lying, Blunt would go out, find a child, ask them to shoot them, and then explore the room and retrieve the alien. The first door they came to was opened after a few sharp knocks. A man stood in a white chiffon nightgown. The Pepsi-branded kimono fluttered, exposing genitalia and wisping circular black chest hair. The man reported to having no aliens and having seen nothing. He wanted to return to what Blunt could only assume was some sort of sexual congress inside the dark motel room. As they kept checking motel rooms, Blunt finally turned to Sky. You know what? what's interesting about the name Paradise Motel, or Hotel, whichever one it is, it's Hotel on the Maps, 
but it's it's obviously a motel. What's interesting about the name is it sounds like a misnomer. The paradise implies permanence, that it couldn't be paradise. If you had to leave, it couldn't be paradise. If you visit it, if it's not infinite, it's surely not paradise. If you go to heaven and you have to come back to hell, or even here, it's not really paradise at all. It's just a visit. But I feel like those aren't mutually exclusive, that perhaps the definition of paradise should be a hotel, it should be a visit along the way, it should be a few moments, one afternoon or one day, or a week or a year, or just some memories that paradise isn't infinite, and perhaps definitionally it needs to be changed, that people need to rethink what our conception of paradise is, instead of an infinite reward, it's very momentary and temporal and delicate. The paradise is, is more of a cocktail drink, you know, you drink it once and it's gone, rather than the ocean. The paradise is a few moments between people sometimes. Sky seemed to agree, and said something in the affirmative, agreeing and agreeing and saying more, and adding on to the concept, sometimes correctly and sometimes incorrectly. Blunt continued, walking along the extended hallway balconies of the Paradise Motel, in the middle of a desert that he had never been to, and never wished to return to. Eventually they opened the a door to a grey, small alien. The small alien is going to be described in detail here. The alien was about the same height as a pregnant woman. He had skin that hung off a more rigid interior body, like a ball sack in many ways, visible underneath his thin grey skin, thin and textured grey skin, was a lattice of green and blue veins, constantly oozing and pumping fluid throughout his body. His skin was loose, his fingers had at least five centimetres excess skin at their tips, and his entire body seemed hypersensitive. He had large, bulging, white, clear eyes. He seemed quite pleasant. He was wearing a small towel covering what would be revealed as very small genitals, similar to that of a human. Blake introduced himself. He told the small, innocent-looking alien that he was from the federal government, and he was here to investigate rumours that a grey had entered the Paradise Hotel illegally and was planning to do business there without a licence. Skye introduced herself too, saying that she was a prostitute and had just had sex with the officer, and was brought along in case there was need of a shooting. The Grey didn't have a name, but precociously explained that he was there on business, and that the license had been revoked because he had changed his appearance and ship in transit, and so the license was applied to the wrong ship, and it was a matter of of paperwork on his home planet and it was nothing to do with our federal government. Blunt wasn't swayed by this argument and told the Grey that he had committed several crimes punishable by execution, selling illegal substances and being an illegal alien were both highly dangerous things for you to be doing so lackadaisically and confessing to an officer who is recording you at this time. The alien shrugged and moved away from the door, allowing Blunt and Skye into the motel room. 
inside they would find a girl putting in earrings, sitting on the side of the bed. She was dressed like a Native American and would leave without saying a word. At the bottom of the bed was an alien suitcase. Write author's note. An alien suitcase is much like a human suitcase. But instead of having two wheels, it has three. And the handle isn't quite as long as our suitcases, as aliens are a lot shorter than most humans. Yo, Mr. Alien. I am actually from the federal government, said Blunt. I am going to have to arrest you if you do not start complying with me. The alien turned around. It was obviously not enjoying being harassed while wearing a towel. Okay, listen up. This isn't a matter for arrest. This, at most, is a civil suit. And we can figure this out today. Let's quickly pop into court, have the discussion, and then you guys can come back, sleep the rest of the day, and then go home and leave me to what I'm doing here. I'm on holiday. I'm trying to enjoy myself. I just geezacked in that Native American girl. Quit harassing me and just serve me the papers. Let's go to court and just be done with this. Chapter 3. Passions of the Sky New Chapter. Galamede. The alien Grey sidled into the bathroom with the towel precariously covering his small genitalia. In there he was putting on shaving cream and acting like he was shaving even though the alien surface was perfectly clear. Blunt, annoyed by the non-resolution of the problem, decided to call the chief. He would have to go outside and hit up the payphone, which he did. Sky wandered off. This would be the last time Blunt and Sky would ever meet, or see each other, or think about each other. Blunt accessed the payphone by dialing in a 12-digit extension number, a city number, a promotional code from his McDonald's burger wrapper, and then finally his date of birth, and then answering a short questionnaire about his satisfaction of his stay at the Paradise Hotel. The phone rang for a minute or two. Each ring was the name of a different soda. Eventually, the chief answered. The chief wasn't too pleased with the non-resolution of this either. He realised that there would need to be a determination crash, which would have to wait, which would have to be organised by the chief, by other higher-ups. This was a bit of a mess, an alien claiming refuge, rather than fighting or jumping in his spaceship and destroying the city. This was a very confusing and unrealistic situation for the CIA and the feds to be in. Blunt returned to the hotel room and explained to the Grey that he would have to formulate a crash and then have a formal instigational meeting at the Coca-Cola building regarding whether or not the alien could stay. The alien agreed for Blunt, this was going to be a laborious and long process, but the alien could just fuck around and not do very much until the day of the crash. Blunt left the hotel. He left his keys in the door and didn't go into reception. Blunt didn't care very much at this point. Blunt cruised just under the speed limit, black, back along the black highway. The automated clouds parted for him now, relieving him of shelter and entering the blistering, empty desert. Blunt reached the airport that he had left 
a few days earlier. He got on the plane that he got off a few days earlier and began to fly across the country, which he had flown across a few days earlier. The plane served 12 courses. Each course was a different flavoured soda pill and then some powdered fast food. When Blunt landed, it was seven hours later. He was dizzy, nauseous, and his eyes were stinging from watching seven hours of commercials on the plane. Blunt landed in Washington, D.C. The D.C. stood for Durger King, an ingenious tie-in with a fast food brand, Burger King. Blunt would spend the next few days organising the investigation crash. This involved sitting in hotel rooms and smoking, going to the Coca-Cola building and setting out five chairs, and buying DMT from a street dealer named Zacharias Monkey Paw. The day of the crash arrived. Blunt, the chief, and a neutral third party that had been pulled off the street in a black van earlier that day were dosed with close to lethal doses of DMT, which were procured from the street earlier. They had a small model of the hotel carved out of white polystyrene. This would help them locate the hotel during their trip and allow them to commune with the alien and the alien's governmental forces back on the alien's planet. They assumed the alien's planet was called Earth, too. After taking the DMT, a few minutes later, Blunt looked down at his hands and felt like crying. He felt like thanking the venerable organisms, the spider-like five-pronged friends that helped him express so many things and talk to so many people and do so many things and were more of himself than his feet or his legs or his arms or his eyes or his mouth sometimes. He had a great sense of duty and gratitude towards his hands. They all began focusing on the Paradise Hotel. The chief was burbling with small spit bubbles funneling out of his mouth. They were blue. He was chewing Big Dip Mountain Chew Arctic Red. This was dangerous because he could choke and die, and the DMT would affect his gag response and his response to dying and suffocating in a room full of people trying to commune with aliens. They were focusing now. A bright, horizontal beam of energy swept across them and they were in the hotel room in paradise. The alien was there again. The grey. The girl was gone. Both of them. All of them. The room looked more basic and crayony this time, with paint oozing off the walls. The alien was wearing a small black latex coverall, covering his genitals and his nipples, and folding over the top of his head, like the Virgin de Milo coming out of that shell on a beach. As the four men arrived, wearing all black apart from the neutral third party, who was dressed like he worked at Costco and had been abducted earlier that morning. They began straightening and becoming more professional.
Blunt sat down in a white wicker chair, which was rapidly peeling through neglect. He began rubbing his kneecaps, which felt bizarre and knuckle-like, underneath the silken black cloth of his trousers. They were a polyester and Coca-Cola blend, and the refreshing flavour oozed through his skin. The grey turned and said, let's get started then. The grey seemed to do this for an eternity, repeating the same action again and again, becoming taller and elongated, trapezoid triangle-like shapes, crawled spider-like, always keeping a single point on the wall and flexing the others to gain vast distances quickly squirreled across every orifice of the room, closing windows and doors and funnel- funneling over the ceiling, collapsing the walls in on them. The complex spider's web of geodesic shapes glistened and reverbed as the grey turned again and again. The door of the Paradise Hotel opened, and it was to Earth too. The Fed stood, and followed the Grey, cordially outside, to Earth too, to the waiting tribunal. Unfortunately, the neutral third party was sitting, burbling on the bed. Some of the geodesic shapes had crawled into his eyes and ears and his brain was desperately trying to retain some sort of semblance of a human through the wash of triangles and monolithic signs and shapes and colours. The two federal officers started holding hands. They were worried that one of them, or themselves, would start wandering off Wander into Earth 2's busy bazaars, internet cafes, or perhaps off a bridge, and be lost forever in the DMT communion. The alien led them into the tribunal room. It looked like a large vending machine repository, with vending machines being rolled in and out and stored vertically and horizontally on large banks. The floor was sloped like a swimming pool, but with a much less extreme gradient. In the middle of this large expanse was a drain, like a pool's. In addition to that was four aliens and a conference table. In the middle of the conference table was a circular Cisco telephone system. As the two feds arrived with the grey, Blunt decided to crack wires and say, well, if you had a phone, we could have just called you. He seemed to say this four more times and then began coughing. The starch on his collar was causing his throat to become numb, and he could taste blood. The greys at the table weren't impressed. They were wearing high, vampiric collars. They replied in unison, with only one speaking. Yes but a phone call would take a few billion years to reach your planet from ours. This seemed very obvious to Blunt all of a sudden. He smiled like a child who had just covered himself with jam, would smile at a mother or parental figure because children can have parental figures other than mothers and fathers now. And that all made sense. The chief seemed to try to almost apologise, but didn't get very far. 
he became began smiling too, but in an I've just pissed my pants kind of way, which he had, but that was fine. The meeting began with Blunt, the Chief, and the Grey sitting on one almost endless side of the conference table and the aliens, the other aliens, sitting on the other side. As the aliens spoke, talking about treatises and treaties and poetry and love and an alien's right to visit another planet, Blunt had a very short set of questions. He wanted to know about paperwork. He had another question about timeline. If it would take billions of years for a phone call to arrive, how did this alien arrive? He didn't have any of his questions answered. The chief had different questions. He had questions about the alien concepts of death about music, about vibrational energy transcending life and death, and moving apart continents like undersea plates, or uniting them like undersea plates. The negotiation was long and arduous. Eventually it was decided that the alien could stay, and could have stayed all along, and it was independent of human or federal control. It was decided that the chief would grow small wings from the top of his head and would fly from now on, cheatering like a bird. He would become a bird in actuality, with little fat legs and a body and a short tail and small vestigial wings by his side which would echo the gorgeous, tall wings from the top of his head. Blunt was happy. This task was done, it could be checked off. He could go back to his apartment, which he shared with 15 other federal officers. Working in shifts, they would relax in the sitting room or the living room then moved to the bedroom where they would rest for 15 minutes before cycling to the bathroom where they would shave poorly, cutting themselves, dabbing on aftershave, showering with one arm held against the wall, pushing their body up against the blistering Fanta light that was piercing their skin. The meeting was drawing to an end. The feds backed away, thanking the aliens. The Grey returned to the Paradise Hotel. And the CIA officers blended back into the wall of the pool. Blunt reawoke. He was groggy. Under his fingernails was a thick, black, oozing substance. It wouldn't stop oozing for a few more days after this. He put on his sunglasses and looked around. Both his fellow agents were missing. They had probably woken before him and left. But in actuality, the bird that he could hear cheeping was his sergeant. And the neutral third party was trapped in the geodesic, spherical nightmare world, being everly chased by some other trapped spirit, desperately gripping on his leg while drowning, pulling him down deeper, into infinities of psychoses. Bunt smiled and popped a cigarette in his mouth. He had been saving it till a good, m completed mission. As he lit it up, 
more birds appeared and began cheeping and chirping the theme song to Happy Days. The clouds parted on the Marlboro smooth Coca-Cola light cigarette burbled away smoking itself down to a stump in 25 minutes exactly. Epilogue. We washed our weapons in the sea. Blunt continued living his life until at some point he died. It wasn't sudden or dramatic. Definitely not dramatic enough to include in a novel. He did interrogate and investigate the concept of how the alien had got to planet Earth. Earth 1, not Earth 2, if it would take billions of years to get here. Eventually it was decided that the grey on Earth wasn't at all connected to the greys on Earth 2, apart from genetically. It was a complete spurious, spontaneal, spontaneous ejaculation of DNA decades ago that had birthed a race that was identical to the race on Earth 2, allowing them to commune telekinetically across the infinite expanse of space. It was just some cosmic coincidence, a spurious one at that. Blunt didn't become the new chief or anything like that. Instead, he would wear a dog collar in his left hand to signify the loss of chief. His chief. Everyone's chief. The chief never spoke during the entirety of this story. Except from tweeting. Poot to wheat, poot to wheat.